So just to let you know, the, the mission of Terra Matters is a couple of things. It's to bring people together of different ages, uh, different generations, to uh, give young people a voice, and to encourage each other in the fight against climate change. So that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, I encourage you to take some time today to meet someone new, someone from a different school, someone you've never met before, and more than just saying hello, uh, ask them what brought them here today. Why does this matter to them? Why are they here on a Saturday of April vacation? Why is it important? Just get to know one another. I think the more we tell our stories to each other, the more uh, connections we have and the more powerful an impact we can make. The fast pitch session, I'll, I'll tell you how that's going to work. We're going to uh, get rolling here, and we have Lisa is our timer, and each group will have eight minutes, and when you have one minute left in your presentation, Lisa's going to hold up the yellow card. You'll know you have one minute left, and when you see the red card, that means to finish your sentence, and that eight minutes is up, and then if there are any questions, you have a couple minutes for that. So the other thing we'll do to keep things flowing is pick a spokesperson from each group. So for example, USM will talk, and then they will introduce, they'll look at their program and say, the next group up will be Scarborough High School. And Scarborough High School will talk, and when they're finished, they will say, the next group up will be King Middle School, and so on like that. All right, so with that, I'll introduce the group from USM. Come on up. So I just want to thank Gus for all his leadership. I don't think any of us would be here today if it wasn't for his leadership. So let's give him a round. So my name is Aaron Witham. I am the uh, person who oversees the Office of Sustainability here at University of Southern Maine. So I really want to welcome you to University of Southern Maine today. We have ambitious climate commitments and other sustainability goals. So I feel like this is a great setting to have this uh, conference. And just very pleased to see all the energy here and all the people in the audience. So I'm not going to do much more talking. I'm going to hand it over to one of my students. Uh, Abram Marr is one of our leaders of our student EcoRep program. We have 20 students that work in the EcoRep program. They're focused on five different specialty areas. Uh, we have energy and climate material resources, media and outreach, environmental health, and sustainable food. There's all different groups working on different things on campus. So he's here representing energy and climate, and he's the leader of that group. So I'll turn it over to him. Okay, yeah, so I'm Abram. Uh, I'm the student coordinator for the Energy and Climate Group, and uh, I've had a lot of uh, chances to do a lot of good work with EcoReps and kind of see the path that USM is on in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, so first, uh, as many of you probably know, we definitely have an energy problem. How much energy we need and how, and how we produce it has a lot of detri detrimental effects on the environment. Um, so obviously, you know, we're using energy for heat, transportation, electricity, and it's not so much that the idea of using energy is inherently bad, but it's more about the processes of our production of it. So as I would take it, all of you know, because you're here, um, when, we, when we burn fossil fuels, we're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, you know, accelerating the effects of... Can you use the microphone? Oh, yeah, I can totally... Oh, no one told me that. Okay. So as I was saying, um, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, leading to a greenhouse effect and uh, accelerating climate change. Um, so there's a few scopes of emissions. There's scope one, which is direct emissions. So basically, uh, anything that's required to uh, produce heat or anything that the university is directly responsible for uh, scope two is um, basically just purchased electricity, so what we get from CMP. And then scope three is kind of like a catch-all category for anything that um, you need energy for in terms of just doing business as usual at a university. And at USM, we're trying to reduce all three of those. 
So this is a short video I have that really kind of allows you to visualize um, just how much carbon dioxide is going into our atmosphere. Okay, so obviously that's kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, it's kind of like a funny video in a way. Obviously it's not funny, but um, it just really helps to, uh, I guess, visualize a very like invisible problem. A lot of people, they don't, they can't actually see what's going on because you can't see carbon dioxide being released into the air. Uh, but that really helps to show like the magnitude of the problem we're facing. Uh, so climate change, as you can see, you can read all of those effects, um, but I think it's more important just to think about how this has affected people and animals. Uh, think of like the past hurricane season and how many people were displaced or lost uh, basically their way of life because of you know all these category four and five hurricanes. And a lot of that's due to uh, like increased storm intensity and frequency. Um, I want you also to think of all the animals that are losing their habitat due to the rising temperatures, and even like Maine fishermen, how they'll be affected by changing seas. So, uh, at USM, we're committed to becoming carbon neutral by the year 2040, which is definitely an ambitious goal, but you have to shoot for it at this point because this issue is not gonna slow down anytime soon. So basically, we're going to achieve that goal uh, through energy efficiency projects, waste diversion, and uh, crafting kind of a sustainable culture on campus with the last 25% or so going to carbon offsets. Um, and we often get a reputation of being like eco reps as being kind of like tree-hugging hippies. But as you can see, we're quite organized and calculated. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And uh, I guess one of the main reasons I'm, I'm up here is to talk about like my experience as an eco-rep and working with other students. And it's been an awesome part of my college experience. I've really had a chance to work on actual projects and getting an actual work experience. Uh, I personally worked on uh, basically getting a card pooling program complete with an app uh, for the campus so we have more options to uh, efficiently transport ourselves. Um, I've also done a lot of data entry about uh, energy information, and I can't say that's been the uh, most exciting part of my time as an eco rep, but it's necessary. Uh, and currently, we're actually working on a uh, community based social marketing campaign to get people in residence halls to commit to certain sustainable behaviors. Uh, that's still underway, and I can't wait to see how the pilot of that goes and maybe even implement it at a larger scale. Um, so all in all, I've also seen uh, a lot of other students doing great projects ranging from like starting composting programs to managing community gardens. It's just been awesome to see. Uh, so we're a part of the President's Climate Commitment. It's basically a network of colleges that are committed to becoming more sustainable. And uh, if you have any interest in attending USM, uh, feel free to talk to me or Aaron at some point and we can talk, tell you all about eco reps in the school in general. So. With that being said, I'd love to introduce Scarborough High School. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Gus, for uh, uh, organizing this whole event and I guess giving us um, an ability to speak about the projects that we're currently doing. Um, so my name is Ryan O'Leary and I'm a junior from Scarborough High School. Um, and I'm part of the Environmental Club of Scarborough at Scarborough High School. Um, so, a little bit of our club background. So, we have weekly meetings every Friday, and we do a lot of um, projects around uh, school recycling, composting, organic gardening. Um, getting, we, we're doing a really big project right now trying to get solar panels on our school. And overall, we're just trying to um, do a lot of things to um, really make some community change in Scarborough. 
And through like all of our action um, as an ambitious club, we've increased our membership from six members um, to 98 as of now, um, six members in 2016. Um, and we have 98, but only about 30 to 40 come to each meeting. So um, it kind of varies. But anyway, as we grew this club and really had some community action, we realized that um, this was obviously community action on a small scale, so we were making real changes in Scarborough, and that it was a really easy way to pull in new or interested students into the environmental movement, because students were a lot more, um, they were more interested in getting involved in like a, something after school with their friends, instead of like going to Sierra Club and like making the effort to go somewhere else. So it was a lot easier to get more kids involved if it was through the school. Um, so overall, we saw that this was a really good model for like making small change on a community scale. Um, but with that said, a couple students and I wanted to make bigger changes. So we started asking the question, um, how can we use the existing infrastructure of high school level environmental clubs to make statewide change? And so we started this year, we started something called the Maine Youth Environmental Association, or MAYA for short. Um, and basically we had the mission statement to connect, unite, and inspire high school level um, environmental clubs across the state um, and to promote more youth activism and to get more young people involved. Um, and so this school year we assembled a leadership team of five students, four from Scarborough and one from Cape Elizabeth, and we reached out to um, a bunch of schools and currently we're in association with eight high schools in the area um, in like greater Portland. Um, so I've actually had the opportunity to visit all of the clubs this year so far um, and kind of see how each club runs. And a couple of things that I noticed was that clubs were on very different levels, like they had varied successes and failures. Clubs had like really small clubs or like really successful clubs and were doing a bunch of different projects. Um, but I guess through the process I realized that um, if we could come together and join more of a coalition um, of students, then we could use these clubs to start making community change and also um, form like a student coalition around the state. Um, so we can learn from each, other ex each other's experiences and uh, solve state level issues. So, oh, sorry, um, so what have we done so far? Um, so, our big event in January was that we rallied at the Maine Climate Protectors DEP petition send-off um, at Portland City Hall. We've also um, sent out four monthly newsletters. Um, we've had like uh, leadership team meetings every other week, and we've had a couple regional meetings with representatives from each school. Um, and our big project right now is that next weekend we're actually hosting a youth environmental convention, which I realize is kind of ironic because we're at a youth environmental convention right now. Um, but that's just kind of how it played out, although we're kind of taking this in a different direction. We um, really want to um, have club members as clubs like share their successes and failures from this year um, so that they can, and also just so that we can be inspired to join um, the first statewide youth environmental coalition um, for bigger projects for next year and for years to come. Um, uh, so we wanna have speakers, workshops, gallery walkthroughs of each club, discussions, prizes, and free food. Um, and if anyone's interested, um, any high schoolers or middle schoolers, then just contact me afterwards. Um, but so I guess what do we wanna do with this model for next year? Um, so one of the things is that we really wanna be able to achieve nonprofit status um, so that we can be eligible for donations and grants from larger businesses. Um, and a big thing for us is that we want to start a website so that we can archive different projects from each club so that we can inspire like new high school or new high schools to like replicate those and see what they can do in their communities as well as um, just raise public awareness and have a site for people to go to to see like what we're doing. Um, and so one of our big ideas that we had for next year is um, to send students to citizen climate lobbies um, lobby day in DC which is next November. Um, and two other high schoolers from Scarborough and I had the opportunity to go um, to DC to lobby on a national uh, scale um, with Citizens Climate Lobby this year, and we thought that it would be a really cool opportunity to get students 
um, and bus like 15 to 30 students there um, just to get the experience of like lobbying on a national scale for an environmental solution. Um, and we also wanna do things like host community-wide educational movie nights about like environmental issues globally, as well as um, rally and lobby against statewide um, issues like ocean acidification and um, uh, protecting our wildlife and national parks. Um, so I guess in conclusion, the potential impact of what we're proposing is that um, we can revamp the environmental clubs that are already existing at each school so that they can make community change. We can also give, just generally give the youth um, a voice um, and help them find that voice for their future of their environment. And um, I guess form a determined, passionate, and relentless youth environmental coalition for Maine. Um, and so what we are asking right now is that we need generalized funding, so we don't exactly have a specific amount that we need um, because we have so many places that we can take this in different directions. Um, and local support. So yeah, that's about everything I have. Um, is there any questions? Um, okay, so now, oh, um, I guess we're, um, King Middle School will be presenting next. Hi, we're the Environmental Awareness Club at King Middle School, and my name is Freya. And the problem that we're mostly focusing on is not many people are being educated on climate change and other environmental issues. So. Um, our problem connects to climate change because we decided that there's not enough education around climate change, and we need to make change soon if we want the oceans to stop rising and so we can get more renewable energy? Um, of course, climate change affects the entire world, but um, to our community specifically, um, we're a coastal city, so oceans rising and also um, the fishing industry will also be drastically affected by this possibly. Um, our solution is to create a mural that will show simple steps that you can take to lessen the effects of climate change. It will educate people who aren't really knowledgeable about the issue. So on our mural, we're going to have a staircase coming out of the ocean. And on each step of the staircase, there are going to be solutions to climate change. At the bottom, there's gonna be like easier solutions, like buying a renewable water bottle reusable. And then at the top, there are going to be like larger solutions like renewable energy, like getting solar panels on your house. Um, so at the bottom of the staircase, there will be more, it'll look like more of what our future could look like if we continue on our current path. And closer to the top, it'll be like a brighter and more sustainable future with like a lot of bikes and maybe wind turbines. Um, we also wanted to, our mural to be like mobile so it could move around easier and a lot of people would be able to see it. Um, I'm mainly here as a visiting artist. So I'm a graduate of Mecca and I'm here to help with the mural logistics and making it um, come together. Um, so I've just seen the impact of murals within the realm of social change and how effective they are. And um, they're just very accessible and because everyone can read and understand it easily. And I think I, I just really love communication and that's one of the reasons why I've gotten into this realm of art making um, and specifically art based on social change. Um, and I started coming to Gus's King Middle School class so that I could um, just get involved. Gus emailed me sometime last October. And um, every, I think the mural idea, it was at least established that we would be making um, some sort of art piece and we were leaning towards a mural from the beginning. And so we brainstormed and sketched and came up with the final idea and the final imagery, but we're still working on like the formatting of that. And um, we have a poster out there that we worked on 
that shows like kind of the main idea of what, um, what it's gonna look like in the end. And um, yeah, the, the idea of it being a mobile mural is really exciting, like moving it from site to site. So we are looking for places to host that piece. And we were thinking about um, Maine College of Art and also the public library. Um, and let's see what else. Yeah, art is just, it's a culture creator and an instigator that's usually welcome within communities. And it can, it becomes kind of like an institution within a community and it's like something that you look for and look towards. Um, and yeah, we're definitely not the first people doing an environmentally based mural, but it's important to keep creating those so that we can keep moving forward and keep, it's like a reminder. It's kind of like a remind, like when I go to the grocery store at Hannaford or wherever, and they have like a little sign, like bring your reusable bag. And I have to like turn around and go back to the car and get my reusable bag. It's like, yes, thank you, Mural. You have like all the information I need. <laughs> Not all of it, could use some more, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to get started on painting this with these guys, and thank you so much for working with me. I really appreciate it. Cool. And who's up next? St. Joseph. Yeah, St. Joseph. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Caleb, and this is Sam, Rebecca, and Rachel, and we're from St. Joe's. And so our, uh, our, the big problem that we focused on was biodiversity loss. So uh, we need biodiversity, like it's important to have uh, multiple species working together uh, for healthy ecosystems. And um, so if they, if they become impaired, then our societies could fail. So it's important to just have that, that um, synergy between the species. And in a recent study we found that uh, or we didn't find, the paper suggested that climate change was becoming the top threat to biodiversity loss. And so that's how we um, connected it between climate change and biodiversity. And so uh, climate change can impact species in uh, a few different ways, one of them being um, the distribution of species. So, uh, and then we're in Maine, we're noticing the loss of bees and that's how we narrowed it down. Yeah, so specifically in Maine, um, we know that bees are important to our agriculture and our food system because 75% of the fruits and vegetables and other plants that we eat depend on bees for their pollination. Um, so one staple crop that we have in Maine is blueberries. So if we lose a detrimental amount of bees, our blueberry stocks will also go down. And so last year, we had a good blueberry crop season, but there were 85,000 hives that came into the state. And those bees didn't survive as well as, the norm, as our native bees. So the more native bees we have, the better our, um, the health of our plants will be. And, we looked into several solutions that we could have, we can do to help this. So on our college and surrounding community um, level for a solution, we came up with becoming B certified at our school. And so to do this, we are going to be following these seven steps that include establishing a, establishing a committee and developing a habitat plan, hosting awareness events to raise awareness about this problem, um, sponsoring student community-based learning projects to enhance our pollinator habitats, um, offering pollinator-focused courses and workshops to dive in even deeper to this issue, um, posting signage to educate the campus and broader community, sharing, um, maintaining a web presence to share these issues, and annually applying for renewal. Um, so in order to actually put these steps into play, we are going to um, 
develop our habitat plan to include a pollinator garden that's made up of native safe plants and use an integrated pest management system in the garden. And with that, we're gonna be making and putting up bee houses. And to even further that, we're gonna be um, proposing a gardening course at the college to learn uh, actually about the pollinators for everyone in our college and to maintain the bees in the garden that we're gonna be proposing, developing. So we will need to create a committee to approve or enhance the habitat plan, which is making a valuable um, pollinator garden and to build the bee homes that we will have on campus. Um, someone will be in charge of taking care of these beautiful creatures. Um, a course and syllabus will be needed and to be presented to St. Joseph's College and then we will fulfill the B certification and requirements and become B certified. <laughs> and that's it. So, yeah, that's about it. No. Um, so, anyone else? No? So, I think we're going to break now. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So our timer's back, so we can now start the second session. I know people are um, going to be straggling in from in the lobby. And I've moved the stands back so they're not in the way. The microphones are, are cordless, so you can just grab them. So we're going to start with, and in case you weren't here for the beginning, the way this will work is, for example... The Friends School starts, so they'll make their presentation, eight minutes. Uh, we have a timer here. She'll hold up the yellow card when you have one minute left, and when you see the red card, finish your sentence, and you're done. Uh, if there are questions, you have two minutes for questions, and then the Friends School will say, up next is Kent's Hill School. Kent's Hill School will go through the same thing, and they will introduce Casco Bay, and Casco Bay will uh, finish with College of the Atlantic, and then we'll wrap things up this morning. All right, so with that, I'll introduce the Friends School. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Kate Bramley Simmons. This is Freya, Vi, and Anna. We are middle schoolers at the Friends School of Portland. You could say that the Friends School of Portland has style. I mean, how can you deny it when we have some of the best ways of bringing electricity, water, heat, and air conditioning, air conditioning to its students and staff? We know that using fossil fuels isn't where the future lies. Our, our school toilets only use the tiniest bit of water per flush, about one-fifth of regular old toilets. And our school has one of the coolest rooftops in all the land. 144 solar panels that transmute Maine's beautiful sunlight into a huge percentage of the French school's electricity. The sun powers the lights that turn on and off in response to motion. It also powers heat and air conditioning that adjust to a comfortable temperature. Heat pumps transfer air in and out of the building, warming or cooling the air as needed and keeping it fresh. Solar energy helps power everything we plug into the walls. The building keeps us warm with nearly three feet of insulation in the ceiling and nearly, and nearly a foot in the walls. It is so efficient, our bodies are able to produce much of the heat we need. Our school is down with the kids and ready to fight for their well-being in a quickly and energy-efficient way. And part of one of... Ugh. <laughs> Sorry. Part of what our cool school has been doing is brewing a climate team. Earlier this year, our team set up a table at drop off and pick up, exhibiting sheets and sheets of petition paper ready to be signed. It wasn't uh, this petition, it wasn't like those other random super duper law changing political petitions that you come across downtown. It was special. This petition was a super duper political law changing petition for our earth. 
Maine has a 15-year-old law that sets a goal of reducing greenhouse gas ed- emissions, sorry, Suffic- sufficient to reduce any dangerous threat to the climate. The petition for which we helped gather signatures asked the Maine Department of Environmental Protection to make rules to implement this law and actually help us reach this goal. In all, our school gathered quantities of signatures, helping the petitioners reach almost 700 signatures in all. This winter, we also hosted an art build to make banners and posters that we brought to a celebratory petition send-off. On January 24th, we gathered with other schools and organizations in Portland City Hall to persuade the public to care about this issue and celebrate the filing of the petition, which took place later that day at the DEP. And we've just heard that the DEP is to hold a public hearing on this petition on May 15th at 1 p.m. in the resource room of its Augusta office. Yay. We um, plan to submit testimony and hope that you will too. Um, For more of the information, go to the website of Maine Climate Protectors, the sponsors of the petition. Okay, here we go. HTTP colon slash slash Maine dash climate dash protectors dot org. Okay. Um, Also, check out the website of the Maine Secretary of State. He should be publishing a formal notice of the hearing with pertinent details on or shortly after April 25th. Um, that's at www.maine.gov slash SOS. Um, and there will also be information on the petition on our table outside the hall and on the table of the 350 Maine um, during the Deering Oaks Rally. So thank you. My name is Anna Siegel. I'm a sixth grader at the Friends School of Portland, and I love ice cream. In the summer, I will have ice cream for dinner, or get it at my local ice cream store by biking almost every night of the week. I try to get this cone as much as possible and encourage others to do the same, but nevertheless, I see an abundance of wasted spoons, plastic spoons. That's a problem. Just as fossil fuels are the primary source of climate changing greenhouse gas emissions, so too are they, fu- are they the fundamental raw material for the manufacture of plastic. With plastic, we are contaminating our lakes and rivers and choking the oceans of the earth. Right here in Casco Bay, bits of microplastic, pieces of plastic so small they are virtually invisible to the naked eye, were found last summer by the friends of Casco Bay in every single liter of water they sampled. Oysters and mussels grown off the main coast have been discovered to concentrate an average of 177 bits of mycoplastic per organism. Because plastic does not break down, but just breaks up, the estimated 8 million metric tons of plastic debris now awash in the world's oceans are doomed to become over 16 billion pounds of mycoplastics, a genuine plastic soup, much of which will be eaten by creatures of the sea and predictably by human beings. So I have started a project to cut down on plastics in ice cream stores. The project so far has come in two parts. The first part is outreach. I have written a letter that kids can use as a template for mailing to ice cream stores in their own towns. This letter introduces the problem, shows examples and prices of better spoon options, such as wooden spoons, compostable spoons, even edible spoons, and invites the ice cream store to make a switch, or at least to communicate further about the problem and its solution. The second part of the project relates to consumer awareness. Our climate club took a first step in consumer awareness two weeks ago when we hosted an ice cream party for middle school students. While we all ate ice cream, out of cones in that instance, I talked about the problem, introduced the letter, and solicited volunteers to get in touch with their own local stores. The reaction was positive and heartening. We have more steps to take, possibly including a bus tour of Portland to gelato and ice cream stores to communicate our message with business owners. But for now, that is our current project. Thank you. What? 
All right, hello everyone. Um, I'm glad to see you all here today. So we're from Kent Hill School, which is a co-ed boarding school of about 250 students in Kent Hill, Maine, um, which is about 15 miles west of Augusta. And we're gonna introduce our biodiesel project. Yeah, so basically our problem is that we use a lot of fuel. Um, I've been doing a project in recording um, and calculating the fuel use of our school, and in our petrol engines, we're going over 340,000 miles a year, um, which equates to around 28 to 30,000 gallons of petrol fuel. Um, and our diesel vehicles are going around 10 to 20,000 miles a year, which equates to around um, 1,100 uh, gallons of diesel fuel. Um, so basically, um, we have a huge problem of um, just that students need to get a lot of places for sports and they need to get back home for breaks and transportation to Boston for trips like that and it just equates to a lot, a lot of fuel. Yeah, so the main issue surrounding climate change and air pollution is that we are currently digging up um, fossil fuels that are millions of years old and putting them into the environment, um, into the atmosphere, which really never is supposed to happen. And um, so this is the primary source of air pollutants, um, is the CO2 emissions, and diesel fuel in particular, with the diesel engines, burns a lot dirtier than petrol oil, so um, there's um, more carbon per liter that's um, sent into the atmosphere when it's burned. So basically our fleet of vehicles on campus, um, we have actually seven diesel engines. We forgot one, there's a pickup truck that I originally thought was petrol but um, is actually a diesel engine. Um, we have a bus, a dump truck, two tractors, and we actually have a ski hill on our campus for our Alpine team, um, which has a groomer um, as well as a ski lift or a rope tow. Um, and these use that uh, like I was saying, that 1,100 gallons of diesel fuel per year. Um, and what we looked at as well was the amount of cooking oil that we used in our dining hall and student center, um, basically frying food um, for students um, for dinners or for snacks or things like that. Um, and what we found is that um, in our three, oh, there's over 440 gallons of cooking oil that we produce each year, um, which when you put that in context of our 1,100 gallons of diesel fuel is almost 50%. Um, and so when we look around at our local community, um, there's also restaurants in our surrounding area that produce cooking oil as well um, that are not currently um, like committed to giving them away, uh, giving it away to a certain organization or a biodiesel producer. And when we look at all of that and combine it with our 440 gallons, we're looking at around 2,200 to 2,500 um, gallons of cooking oil waste uh, every year that's not being used. That's a lot. Um, and so our partial solution to this um, ever-growing problem is to run all of our diesel engines on campus to carbon neutral biodiesel. So um, this reduces our carbon positive fossil fuel based contributions to the atmospheric CO2 by using biodiesel, a carbon neutral fuel. And so um, one of the beauties of the pr pr production of and processing of biodiesel is that it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So as much as um, waste cooking oil that we have, we can make that exact amount into biodiesel, which is really cool. Um, so what are the costs? Um, we calculated it to be about $5,000 to get our own processor, get storage space, have the time and later where that's committed to making this on campus. So that means we wouldn't have the same amount of emissions by having it travel to a processor that's pretty far away because we're in a pretty remote location. Um, so what does this take? It's going to take a lot of administrative support, which currently um, we don't have, uh, but we can definitely work towards that in creating a full proposal to make this happen. Um, we need local support, so having those restaurants on board, um, we've spoken to them and they, they are currently getting paid to um, have their cooking waste oil um, taken away, but we could probably work out some sort of deal that would um, provide incentives for them as well. Um, we'd need financial support from donors, um, environmental organizations, or something like that, and also alumni. We have a pretty strong alumni donation base. 
Um, so how does this impact our local community? Well, it's um, currently being used for hunting, which is not really great, but um, less so at the moment. Um, it's a really exciting opportunity for students. It could call for a class or a course curriculum that could be really environmentally aware and, um, and promote awareness for students. Um, it uh, decreases the fumes from diesel engines. It's carbon neutral, it's pretty awesome. And even a better smell. So, I mean, wouldn't you rather be behind a bus that smells like french fries or burritos rather than one that smells like diesel? <laughs> and skiing to one too, which is pretty great. Um, so how is this going to impact our larger community? It, um, for boarding schools, it's going to set a really unique precedent because there aren't that many schools that, um, or if any, besides Shawanki, that um, have this in place at the moment. For state and nationwide, it encourages um, biodiesel to make it a really easy and affordable method um, to be more carbon neutral and uh, accessible. Globally, it's going to encourage cleaner energy and maybe even slow down climate change if we can get a lot of people on board. So, yeah. Yeah, so basically, by mitigating our combustion of diesel fuel, um, we're able to decrease our air pollution by, instead of digging up um, these fossil fuels and burning that, just using stuff that um, we would originally be putting in the landfill um, and use it for um, a way to reduce our school's carbon footprint and um, make Maine uh, more sustainable. Yes, yeah, so this is a really exciting opportunity that we're hoping as seniors to hand down to the reins of some younger students who would really be able to energize our administration. Yeah, so are there any questions for us? Yeah, sure, right there. And who's next? Ooh, oh, and next up is Casco Bay High School. Okay, so uh, thank you for having us. We're Casco Bay High School. I'm Lucia. I'm Lily. And I'm Siri. Um, and we are part of the Green Club at Casco Bay High School. I think that it's clear to all of us here today that climate change is currently ravaging our planet and especially our beautiful state. Um, we have all lived in Portland our entire lives and we see these changes happening. The most drastic of these changes are occurring in our oceans as it becomes more acidic and the levels rise. Ocean acidification is a result of excess CO2 in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is emitted in many ways from transportation and electricity to industry and agriculture. CO2 emissions dissolve into the ocean forming carbonic acid. This lowers the pH level of the ocean and raises the acidity level. 26% of the carbon dioxide emitted from human activity is absorbed by the ocean. This equates to 24 million tons of carbon dioxide that the ocean absorbs every day. And in the Gulf of Maine, it's warming 99% faster than the rest of the world. This means an enormous change in the oceans is happening extremely quickly. Since 2007, the acidity level in the Gulf of Maine has raised by 0.3%. Consequently, the shells of lobsters, scallops, oysters, mussels, and other shellfish are slowly deteriorating. And this will detrimentally affect Maine's economy. Shellfish make up 87% of Maine's commercial fishing industry. And just as great of an issue as ocean acidification is sea level rise. Between the years 2009 and 2010, sea levels off the coast of Portland had risen five inches. Coastal communities are going to have to deal with the extreme flooding that's going to happen. As a green club, we wanted to tackle these substantial problems. Um, when our green club was discussing how we can create our slice of the solution to acidification and sea level rise, we kept coming back to solar energy. Solar energy offsets carbon dioxide emissions that could potentially be absorbed by the ocean. So we did some research and discovered that our school, Casco Bay High School, uses about 25% of our building's energy as we share the building with Portland Arts and Technology High School. We began to make a plan. Um, we plan to reach out to other high schools in Maine that use solar energy and talk to Revision Energy to examine the feasibility of this ambitious project and estimate the potential savings. Ultimately, this information will help us draft a proposal that we plan to present to the school board.
we've already taken some steps towards this goal. We talked to representatives at Camden Hills High School, um, which is a school that recently installed solar panels. Um, and their switch to solar energy has proven to be an immense success. Uh, the entire process was efficient and it didn't disrupt um, the education that was taking place. I believe it only took a year. Um, and they also negotiated a plan with Revision Energy that made the solar panels much more affordable and allowed them to pay off the solar panels at no upfront cost over a long period of time with a third party investor. After speaking with Camden Hill High Schools, we got in touch with Revision Energy. Um, they very generously helped us by outlining the logistics and costs of the project. They found that they could install roughly 1,438 solar panels on the Casco Bay High School and PAS buildings if we maximize both rooftops, as you can see in this image. Um, the 460.2 kilowatt array would produce more than 538 thousand kilowatts hours of clean on-site solar electricity um, each year for the next three to four decades. This solar energy system would offset more than five, 50 percent of the school's total annual electricity consumption and more than 560,000 pounds of carbon pollution annually for the next 30 plus years. The solar energy system would cost approximately $9,090, however, sorry, $990,000. However, Revision Energy would allow, has a power purchase uh, agreement that would allow Casco Bay High School to install the panels with no upfront cost with a third party investor and would have payments scheduled for the following years. We hope with the information we have gained, we will be able to present to the school board our proposal to install solar panels and eventually implement solar energy at our school. We have a substantial amount of work left to do, but we are excited to see where this project could go and the change it could make. Thank you for your time and attention. Does anyone have any questions? Who's up there? Um, next up, College of the Atlantic. Hi, my name is Paige Nygaard. I'm Yaniv Korman. And my name is Yula. And we're from College of the Atlantic, and this is our campus in Bar Harbor on Mount Desert Island. Um, as you can see, it's on the water. We're very connected to the environment. Acadia National Park is basically our backyard. Um, we're a very small college, about 350 students, but we come from all over the country and all over the world, um, all studying one major, which is human ecology. So we're looking at how humans interact with the built and natural environment. So sustainability is really at the core of a lot of what students do and learn and participate in at the school, whether it's in the classrooms, which such as like environmental law or marine biology, or it's in clubs or what we're doing in our day-to-day -day life. We have two different farms at our school as well as some gardens on campus. Um, and we also have like a food security program, um, Share the Harvest, where we, uh, it's a student-run run effort that provides uh, farm vouchers and food deliveries for low-income families on the island. Our school has about 30% of the food that comes from local sources. Uh, our, we have a really cool discarded resources program at our school, um, which has been led by students. <laughs> um, so we've had a couple waste audits, basically looking at everything that we're getting rid of and putting it in a tent and sorting it all out and seeing where it's coming from. Um, and so there's a zero waste club on campus that does that. We have a campus sustainability for, a committee for sustainability. So for example, with the waste audits, after they looked and saw everything that we had, they made goals and policies to make sure that we were lowering our waste. So from taking the 2015 numbers by 2020, we'll divert 70% of our waste. By 2025, it will be 90%, and then until we're a zero waste campus, which means we compost a ton. We make sure that our containers are, um, recyclable or reusable. And then we have a community energy center, um, which participates in um, 
renewable energy on campus, we have various solar arrays, a wind turbine, and as well as reaching out to community members in the MDI community as well as the larger Maine community. Do you want to say something about the other initiatives with the CCS? Um, yeah, we are also working on an animal protein uh, policy where we check what kind of food is coming to our campus and where is the animal protein is coming from and trying to decrease carbon emission from that. Um, we are looking at water, how we can reduce water use, and also we have a sustainability, a sustainable building policy where every new building on campus have to follow the specific criteria. And now, for example, we're building a new um, classroom building, so the students and the committee are very involved together with the architects and are trying to incorporate sustainable um, composting toilets and other kind of technologies that we want to incorporate and make the building more sustainable and durable. Yeah, so another thing too is by 2030 we're trying to be a fossil fuel campus. In the past we'd been carbon neutral, but we have realized that we're not a super big fan of um, carbon offsets. So we're trying to um, really actually address the root stem of the problem. And we have other efforts too, looking at the national and international picture as well. Uh, yes, so there's a space on campus called Earth and Brackets uh, that's referring to some of the, U uh, the United Nations language um, that exists around climate change negotiations. And so they created a space so that students can learn um, climate justice organizing from other activists uh, across the state, the country, and the world eventually. So we have students' delegation going to the uh, United Nations climate change negotiations so that the students can continue work outside of Maine, but also yeah, learn skills so they can then apply later on. We have a large international student population, so they can also continue doing work outside and afterwards um, once they graduate from COA. Yes, and we do sustainability in many different forms. So there are a lot of students who get involved outside of classes and doing the kind of uh, discarded resources work, but we also try to really incorporate sustainability in a lot of the subjects that we offer. So um, there are classes on environmental law, uh, students can do independent studies or group studies if there's something that they're particularly interested in. Um, yeah, and they can do senior projects, so something that they, instead of a, a bachelor thesis, they graduate with a senior project. And Yanif did a really cool project that he's going to... Yeah, so we thought that quickly. it would be interesting to explain a little bit that I'll present my senior project, which was um, creating an edible food forest. And when I came to COA, I was always very interested in gardening and landscape. Uh, and I knew that there was a student 10 years ago who restored an old garden because our campus was originally, um, it was actually a state of summer people who you would come and have summer houses on, on the island. Um, so they had really beautiful gardens. And then when I came, I thought, mm, I want to also restore a garden, but I want something that will be more connected with the environment. I don't want to just create it normal garden, I want something that will connect to climate change. And I knew um, about the problem of uh, decrease of pollinators, decrease of biodiversity, and the problem that we have now um, between our food system and who we are. You know, People usually just go and buy groceries, and I wanted to think of a way to connect people and students to the food we eat. So there was this very 110 years old garden, and initially I was working with some with a class with a, with landscape architecture class where we restored the entrance arch, and then over this winter I was working. Um, you can pass. I was working with with over the summer. Um, I was working with. I was forming forming a gardening club where together we was we were planning and thinking how we can. Um, encourage more edible plants in this garden. We were working and we were leading different workshops like um, propagation workshop to learn how to propagate plants and we also cooperated with um, Mafka to prune trees and learn how to uh, propagate edible fruits, trees, and then we were starting to plan in, over the winter how we want the garden to look like and how we are going to improve it. Um, and then we created this edible map, an edible booklet that has all the edible plants that will be planted in the garden and with information about what you can do with each plant and how you can eat it and when is the time to harvest it. And we are hoping that this spring we are going to plant 
all the plans. We applied to a few grants. There is the um, FCAS, which is a um, food grant for sustainable food system, and the Wild Ones, which also gave us money to purchase the plant. Um, and we are hoping as a gardening club that more students will start harvesting and eating local fruits that were um, harvested before. Um, and we hope to encourage more of this relationship between human nature, food system, pollinators, and the environment. Yeah, so at COA, we think about trying to bridge different silos and working on all different intersections and ways of thinking about sustainability, that it's not just one way, but we have to encourage people to find their own passion and connect with others about around different projects. So we'd love to talk to you about your projects and connect with you as well. Thank you. And, but just... Before I move on to that, I just want to take, take a moment and think about all that we heard this morning. It's uh, when I think about what the purpose of this summit is, is getting different generations together to talk about these issues and what a positive impact you can make. And the, the young people up here speaking today uh, you really covered your facts. You really know what you're talking about. And I hope that you leave here, and we all leave here, uh, really not waiting for the politicians and waiting for uh, America to move on. You are the voice that needs to push that right now. And, you know, as we leave here, uh, be brave, be bold in what you ask for because you know the truth, you have the facts, and you have, make some really good cases up here. Uh, I'd like to give all the presenters another round of applause, please. For that.